spanning the globe to bring great photographers and their experiences directly to you. It's 5 p.m. in Spain, 6 p.m. in our guest's home in the Ukraine, and midnight here in Japan. That means it's time for the Camera Cafe Show, brought to you by professional photographer Tom Jacob and photography enthusiast Dave Payne. Good evening, Tom. Would you like to welcome our special guest and get things moving? Thanks for your magnificent intro, Dave. And welcome everyone to what is the first episode of our podcast adventure, The Camera Cafe Show. Finally, after some long months of hard planning and work, we have now lifted off. So I hope everybody will enjoy it. And to start our podcast series today, we invited a special guest in a bit of an emotional photography journey through the eyes of a war photographer, live from the Ukraine. Eva Sidash. She will present herself to you in a moment, but for those of you who haven't heard of her, Eva is living in the Ukraine, is 28, only started photography at the age of 19, then went on to study photography and got her degree in 2022, when suddenly from being interested in street photography, she found herself shooting a war in a more documentary way as Russia invaded the Ukraine. She has won competitions, has been published, has been interviewed in international magazines, has her work shown in art galleries around the globe, and has, since we started talking to her, been asked by UNICEF to join as a photographer. So that's all to come, so let's move on. Eva, you are here. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Welcome to our show, Eva, and thank you so much for joining us today, because it hasn't been easy for everybody with the work schedule to, to make it happen, but we did it. Yeah, so, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. No, no, we, we thank you. Eva, before we get to the interview, how are things there in the Ukraine where you live? Uh, it's okay. Uh, I'm from western parts of Ukraine. Uh, I'm from Lviv. So uh, here it's a little bit um, safer, as if I can say like this, because uh, basically um, in the country of war, every, everywhere is a dangerous place. But I'm happy that I'm in my home. Uh, my relatives are fine, friends are fine, so everything is okay. Okay, very good to hear this. Eva, for the listeners, just tell us briefly a bit about yourself and how your photography journey began before the Russian invasion. Uh, okay, as you mentioned already, uh, I'm in the sphere of photography for four years. Uh, I know that it's not much, but uh, since I started in 2019, uh, I devote all my time and myself to photography because I realized that this is something I want to do and I want to follow my this way. And uh, it helped me like to understand that I'm in the right place and I'm doing the right things. So basically I started as a street photographer and it helped me to realize that uh, I can see the world differently. I can notice the details. I can feel like it i don't know how to say and um, what really helped me to become a photographer i would say um i started with the project which is which was called one shot each day uh so basically it was street photography that time and i was going on the street each and every day and publishing the best picture of the day on facebook i was doing this to the one year so quite long project and again, every day. So it helped me to build like new connections with new photographers because uh, before I was like no name and it helped me to be involved in this sphere as much as possible. Also, it helped me to gain like new vision and to develop my skills and to find like to get new experience in this. And after that, I um, switched to documentary photography because I realized that Actually, I love street photography. This is something very special for me. But um, documentary practices helped me to uh, go deeper, I would say, to not just observe the, pro the objects or subjects, uh, but only also to interact with them. And since then, I was working with my own project, documentary series mostly, and um, I started to work as a photojournalist in Ukrainian media, the Ukrainians. Uh, so I got new experiences as, as a photojournalist, and I was working like just as a photojournalist, documenting the regular stuff and working on my personal projects. But then full-scale war began and everything has changed dramatically. 
uh, I switched to freelance because I realized that I want to be independent and I want to do as much as possible to document my country in war. Uh, to go up to the eastern parts, to um, these parts where like um, war is so intense, where people are in danger, like to to help as I can. So for me, it's very important to be uh, involved in this uh, right now because I want to be useful for my country and to do what I can do the best is mm. photography. <laughs> No, no, I, I understand. You just came back from from Kerso, no? I from yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> How was it there? That was tough a little bit because uh, this is like really huge city and region which was uh, occupied for like uh, a lot of time, and now it is uh, liberated, but it is every day under constant shelling. So I came there with, uh, and I heard this um, rocket shelling, or the, not only rocket, but uh, different kinds of Russian shelling, um, really close. And that was, uh, I thought I got used to it because I'm working in this sphere for this year, the whole year and even more. But um, it was strange to see like the peaceful city because now it's under um, Ukraine, but still like all these Russian shellings, which are like nonstop and people who do not pay attention to that because like they got used to it. But uh, every day people are dying there and um, that's so sad. Uh, so that was qu quite a difficult experience, but I, I'm happy I managed to go there because it's a little bit hard to get the access as for now. Taking into into consideration that this is like um, quite dangerous part of Ukraine nowadays, so but that was good. I went, I document what I could, and talk to people, which is really very important for me. So, when you when you are there, Eva, you mm -hmm. ever think that of yourself that your life might be in danger, or you just are in in working and you you, you forget. I, yeah, wonderful question. Actually, I was thinking about this a lot because uh, when I'm working, I'm not. I don't. I'm not thinking about the fact that my life is in danger. But when I'm going there, like by car, by train, on, when I'm on the road, and I understand that today I'm going to the dangerous place, and I have no idea if I'll come back. And this is a very strange and uh, strange feeling because um, I'm not afraid from the other one side, but from another side, this is something, I don't know, it's hard to explain because when you have these thoughts, it's literally something you would never like uh, think you will have when you are working. But yes, unfortunately, I have it. And I think it's good because uh, that way you can, you realize what you're doing and you understand that you are ready to take a risk and you want to, to proceed working in this, despite of uh, this fact of dangerous place. I think it's a bit for another question we had. It's to do because you started documenting this because you felt like you needed to do it you know, for, for your country and for yourself and, and to see other people what is what is going on. I think when photography is a very strong medium and I think when you're inside of it, you kind of put this to the back and then you start working to what you have to do. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Yeah, because uh, I remember when I uh, started just documenting my country in stage of war, uh, there was a lot of emotions and that was really like, tough for me. I, uh, for example, I remember the um, very first days of full-scale invasion and I went to the border, Ukrainian-Polish border. I saw there like a lot of refugees who were trying to flee Ukraine to find safer place and there was like thousands of people there and like small children were crying older people were losing their conscious it was like really kind of disaster when i saw this and like these people were waiting on the queue to cross the border for like 20 hours and it, it was winter it was freezingly cold but they were just standing and waiting to find some safer place. And I remember myself these days, uh, this first day on the border, uh, I was just walking around and literally crying 
but then I realized that like my tears cannot help, but my camera can. And since that, then I realized that um, emotions, it's okay to have them, but I can now, uh, how to say, separate my emotions and my uh, desire to work, to do something. Yeah, because otherwise um, I just can't. <laughs> yes. So can you tell us a bit about your approach in covering such a complex and, and personal emotional topic? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because as for me, uh, to gain a personal approach is very important. And I realized that uh, when I just came to Kharkiv first time, it was like two months after full scale war uh, began, uh, I went to North Saltico. Uh, this is like the biggest residential area. And uh, there, like, almost each uh, building is destroyed of Russian shelling. And people were living in metro stations underground. And I remember I came there and I also saw this picture. And I realized I have to photograph this. But I also wanted not just to document what I see, but I wanted to help somehow these people. Like to give a hand, I don't know. I was talking to them. I would. Li I was listening to them. It was. I realized that this is important for them to be heard, and they want to talk. So for me, uh, I usually speak with people a lot. I'm trying to understand their feeling, and after that, um, I began to photograph, because I realized that the closer I become with people, the more meaningful and honest picture I will receive in terms of photography and also in terms of just relations. When you talk to these people, you see them, uh, they see that you uh, care about their life. And I, I hope it somehow helped them, at least in this moment. And I'm tot I totally mm, agree with this uh, phrase. I think you know this, that like you don't make a portrait of a person. It is the person who gives you this portrait. And uh, yeah, that it works because uh, when you talk to people, when you see that they are open to you and these people see that they can trust you, uh, you will find that uh, the picture will be really honest. It will have something, some, something behind, like picture speaks for itself. So for my approach, it's very important to have some kind of connection with the people whom I photograph. Yeah, this was the change from your street photography to, to more documentary. Exactly, mm. yeah. Okay, and speaking now of people, and so you, you made an outstanding photography project called Holding Hope. Can you share a bit with our listeners what it's about and, and how it started out? Uh, sure, thank you. <laughs> thank you for this. Um, yes, this project is about people who survive uh, Russian occupation in different parts of, uh, mostly it's eastern parts of Ukraine. And for me, that was very important again to to understand them because we all know uh, all these horrible Russian crimes which are done uh, towards civilians under occupation. And I wanted to to talk to these people to understand what they feel, to at least somehow feel their pain because we are all in one country and we are somehow connected. And me, who was never under occupation, and I didn't have this experience. And I wanted to understand what it is about. So I went to these different villages and cities that have been uh, under occupation for some time. Fortunately, they have been liberated, or some are still under occupation. And I talked to these people. And I was making a portrait of them. And next to each, I asked every person to uh, write um, on them, themselves a memory of the occupation. So uh, at the end, I have this project about uh, por which, which, you have, which, have, which we can see portraits and next to it are memories, handwritten memories. And I was surprised because when I was talking to them and asking to write something, 
almost everyone said that uh, we don't know what to write. Like they were a little bit afraid. Why I'm asking this? You can write on your own because uh, uh, they didn't expect this at all. But I, uh, again, I was talking to them a lot. I um, explained, why, explained why I'm doing this because I want to save their memories. Also, I hope it was kind of therapy for them. You know, when you are putting something on the paper, sometimes it, it helps you at least for a second. And then they started to write and usually they couldn't stop. So I understood that they have so much to say and they want to talk if you will listen to them. So that's why for me, this project is so important because it's not only about pictures, about their eyes, which we can see. It's also about something hidden, which usually we don't know. But with the help of this uh, series, it helped me to understand them, their pain, their feelings. And... I hope that maybe it will help even those people who are still under occupation. And the project is called Holding Hope, that even being in such horrible situation, there is the hope that everything will be fine. And these people also had this, and now it's okay. And I hope people who are still under occupation can see this project and also understand that everything will be fine in the end and they will be free, liberated, and everything will be safe for them. Eva, question. You've learned a lot about these people in doing your Holding Hope project. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about yourself while doing this? Yeah, wonderful question. (laughs) Let me think. Uh, I would say that when I photograph, I'm trying not just to be like a stranger who is doing this. I'm trying to feel myself as well. Also in this project, when I was doing this, I was always talking to these people, listening to them. I felt that they are so strong. I'm not sure if I would overcome this as they did. But I realized that very important to have this inner desire to to believe that everything will be fine and everything can be fine. And that's the same with me, even though I'm not sure how I will react in such uh, situations. But I realized that if these people could overcome this because of, again, this hope, hope, uh, some support of friends, then maybe I also can. And this is like a great example for me that people are much stronger than sometimes we think. And maybe... uh, me also i don't know eva while making this project i was curious you have mm-hmm. a, you have someone or or a story that you remember more than than any other one a special one i i think um, all these stories were special but in different ways but yes i uh, one come comes to my mind the first uh, it's about a guy who is 19 years old. He wrote actually this um, on the paper. Uh, in the village of Hrushivka, it's Kharkiv region. Uh, they have been under occupation for the half of the year. And he wrote that when uh, Russian troops came to their village, uh, he started to count Russian tech, uh, equipment, uh, tanks, uh, people and with the help of his his friend he started to of, uh, from ukraine i mean um, from ukrainian forces and he started to give this uh, information to ukrainians ukrainian side in order to help and he he wrote that each and every morning i was sitting next to the window and uh, counting this uh, equipment and people and putting down it on the paper and then writing uh, over the phone to the friend. And each and every evening he was deleting and burning this paper because it was extremely dangerous. And he was only 19 years old, but he kept doing something to, to help. 
you know, he was not afraid that uh, he will be caught. Maybe he was, but he was still doing this in spite of everything. And again, this is, as for me, this is such a huge story. And uh, he told me this story almost right away. And when I asked to write it, to put it down, he said, oh, I don't know. I don't know what to write. I have nothing to tell. And then uh, he, I said, just, just start. And he started and he wrote like two sheets of paper about this uh, story, you know, and he was in the end saying that, like, thank you, thank you for giving me this opportunity to recall it, to understand it even better. So that's why, um, I don't know, taking into account that he was so young, but he was doing that much, it's like something so special. It's wonderful. And when you find people like this and, and they do things like that, yeah, it's amazing. So can you speak a bit to the importance of photography that you think of mm -hmm. bringing, bringing attention to important issues like, like your Russian-Ukrainian war and what photojournalism today brings in this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think this war differs from any other war because um, you literally can watch it online thanks to photography. And all these pictures which are taken and which are shown to the world says, uh, say that this war is still here, it's happening, and people in Ukraine suffer from it. For me, it's very important to talk about this to um, people, to foreigners, to people abroad, because they cannot feel what we feel, because they are far from it. But at least with the help of pictures, they can understand what we are coming through. And I guess that it will be very hard to keep fighting without the help and support of uh, foreigner countries. Because uh, I'm saying, I'm talking about uh, different kinds of support. It can be uh, support of refugees when you are just talking to the people and you understand, I know that you have the war in your country, how are you feeling? And this will be a great help. Or some humanitarian aid, medicines, uh, uh, financial support, like whatever, everything helps. And in order for people to understand the importance of this help, I mean, people who are not here, not in Ukraine, uh, it's very crucial to talk about this, to publish these pictures, to show it, Uh, throughout because I understand that people are a bit sick of the, a bit tired I mean uh, of this war and like it's uh, especially this full-scale invasion maybe it's sad but sometimes we got used to it Ukrainians foreigners uh, whoever and it's very important to still follow this and to show it and to document each and every day and to post new pictures and to talk about this, that, no, we still have this war, we still need help, and we appreciate your help. So that's why for me, um, the role of photojournalism nowadays in terms of uh, war is very important. And that's why maybe uh, I'm also not giving up and I'm taking... I, um, someone can say the same pictures, but it's not the same pictures. It's just the situation which lasts for so long. So this is for me uh, the possibility to tell people that we are still have this, that this war is lasting and we have to do something. Eva, so you're using photojournalism as a way to provide information to those outside so that it stays relevant in their lives. I'm sure our listeners are, are curious, that's a big task. What kind of gear are you using in documenting the war and its effect on the people of Ukraine? Can you share uh, what you're using uh, and, and how? Are you asking about equipment? I, I, I didn't get the question. Yes. What uh -huh, okay. Of, what kind yeah. of camera gear? What mm -hmm. you're you're taking these incredible photos, and and you're right in the middle of things as they're happening. And I'm sure that our listeners are curious: what kind of equipment are you using 
in mm-hmm. a situation where you have to be able to capture key moments, but you also mm-hmm. have to be flexible and be able to move. What yeah. What are you using? Yeah, actually, I'm. Um, I I was I, I'm using. I have been using Fujifilm cameras for all the time, so I got used to this kind of uh, equipment and uh, now I have camera Fujifilm XS10 which is uh, which helps me to it's quite easy one I mean light to handle and also I just love Fujifilm I <laughs> know I love the colors it has the feeling um I um I can see when I when I when I when I uh, look at the pictures. It's just like I feel this camera, and camera feels me. <laughs> I don't know how to say. And I think it's not that important what equipment what equipment you use. It's like uh, how you see the object or what you're photographing. But still, like this camera helps me because I'm comfortable with this. Of course, honestly, honestly, I would uh, be happy to have a little bit better equipment because it's quite a budget one. But um, as for now, I I can afford this one and I'm still happy with with this camera because it's really not expensive, but it uh, gives you um, the result which you want to, to have. Yeah, the tool is not the camera. The tool is the exactly. behind the camera. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and you're you're proof of that. <laughs> there's there's one last question that we'd like to kind of wrap up today's conversation with you, Eva, on. For those who are already into documentary photography, what is one thing you recommend they should start doing? one thing mm-hmm. they should stop doing and why i would say that it's very important to find your own approach because this way you will understand what you are looking for and why uh and this will lead you to your own photography style which is not actually easy but when you have like the approach which you follow it will help you to understand again to understand what you're doing and um, as for me this is very important because uh, your personal approach will give something unique to your pictures and to your style in general but if you're talking about what uh, it's better to stop doing i have a great example i would say do not follow the crowd but go opposite direction for example, um, I remember again first days of full scale invasion, and I was photographing uh, on the railway station when where there was huge evacuation of people, like thousands of people, and I was working with the Magnum photographer Emin uh, Osman, and I just uh, saw this picture. Uh, all of the people were waiting for the train. Photographers, refugees, everyone for this train, who which will bring people from take people from Lviv to Poland, and when finally this this train arrived, every person was running to the train to be able to go inside. People, refugees, together with photographers, and only this one man went opposite direction. I, honestly, I don't know what picture he took, but for me, I realized that this is was kind of, again, personal approach he used. He didn't want to copy pictures and to do just another picture, which all the other photographers will do, but will find his own angle of view. So I would say that for me, it's very important to be creative. Even in documentary photography, it's important to be creative and to listen to yourself. Boy, that's a wonderful point. And to go your own way with your own style. Yes? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just have a tiny question more, Eva. You have a military credentials, no? You told me? Right, yes. To, sure. To go because... I'm not sure if listeners understand how difficult this is. It's not that you jump in your car and you go to the front line because I suppose there are controls and they won't let you pass. 
So how you how you go on in, in when you want to shoot something there? Mm -hmm. how, you, how it works? Yeah, first of all, in Ukraine, it's very hard to photograph now if you don't have accreditation, even for a regular photographer. I mean, not for a war photographer, when you're a landscape photographer, let's say. Uh, it's hard to go on the street and uh, photograph because uh, you can be like suspicious to someone, which I understand because people are suspicious now because they are afraid a little bit and they are cautious. And in order to photograph um, next, not far from the front line, you definitely should have accreditation. I would say it's not only about accreditation, it's about your um, responsibility. You should understand that you risk your life and you should have really good uh, equipment with yourself. I, I mean, uh, body armor, hamlet, and you should know how to use the medical uh, stuff uh, for example i have taken two courses for three days each about uh, first medical aid and uh, this is very important when you want to photograph in such uh, places you need to understand that this is really dangerous and you should understand if it worth it and you should be ready and to know what you're what you're facing and what you can do in this or that situation. So accreditation, yes, I got it right away because um, as I told that I was photograph I was working as a photojournalist before. So I have a press card and it, uh, I managed to get the military special accreditation of armed forces of Ukraine and proceed working in this topic mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. And if you go out shooting pictures, you can go alone or there will be always somebody with you? Uh, it depends, because uh, uh, actually this year uh, you could go uh, with your accreditation almost everywhere. You just show the accreditation and you can photograph. But now it's a little bit more difficult because the rules have changed apparently. And now uh, uh, Ukraine is divided into different zones. I mean, let's say there is red zone where photographers, photojournalists cannot unfortunately photograph. It's uh, on the for front line, for example. For safety or for... For this... Mm, it's mostly for the safety, as they said, yeah. But uh, unfortunately, mm, they cannot also show what is going on in this mm, in these uh, areas. And as for me, that's a little bit sad because... Uh, what should photojournalists do? I, I think they should give the information and you should uh, to, to, to people. And now there is another uh, zone when you can, which is also not far from the front line. So you could go there with a special permission and having some press officer with you. But um, let's say liberate, liberated villages, which are a little bit farther from the front line or where the situation is not that bad, you could go uh, alone. But um, usually now you also should get the special um, permission to photograph. It's, uh, uh, for example, in Kherson, I, I went uh, just uh, one week ago and I had to receive like hundreds of permissions <laughs> before I, tr I could uh, photograph there. But I understand that this is important because um, for security reason and for safety reason. But um, I wish that the access is a little bit easier for, for the journalists now. Because as I said, it's very important to document everything, each and every detail. Because in the future, it will be also an evidence of the Russian crimes. And uh, yeah. Eva, the realities are that no more lasts forever. And at some point, there's going to be a new path in front of you. What do you think after the war is over? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Is your photography future? Where is it you would like to take your photography journey next? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's very hard. It's very hard question because uh, literally uh, this war uh, taught us to live one day, uh, to appreciate this one day, and to do whatever you can. And I started living in this way, and now I I don't think about tomorrow much. 
just because we have such reality. So this is hard for me to uh, to answer this question because I'm also um, questioning myself about this. I understand that um, I changed a lot. My photography changed a lot. And what will be next? I don't know. I still want to focus on documentary practices because for me, this is something very honest and I see myself in this. But from other side, I also want to proceed working on my personal projects, maybe some art. I don't know. That's a very hard question. I'm thinking about this, but I don't have answer now because now I'm just doing what I what I can do. And uh, this is the documenting the war which is in my country now. Well, as you say, you're living for today. Yeah. So keep living and keep getting the most out of every today that you can. Thank you. Anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners or add to what we've covered today? Um, I'm not sure we covered a lot. Thank you so much for these questions. And uh, it will be a lot for me also to think after the conversation. Uh, so thank you for this. Eva, can it be you, you, that you have dogs, that you have two dogs? Uh, they are my parents. They live with the parents, these two dogs. But I love them. Yeah, they are so wonderful. <laughs> Because I thought it, it's maybe a bit of an emotional outlet, no? to for your back to normal life a bit. Uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, I would say that uh, photograph um, in this reality and documenting when I'm going to the East, let's say, it's very difficult for me. And still, like, uh, when I'm working, I, I'm putting my emotions aside. And now I know how to do this. I have this experience. But still, when I come back to Lviv, to my home place, uh, it's very difficult for me because then I start thinking what I just lived through. Memories about uh, people who told me their memories and all this information is in my head and it's it's tough sometimes, it's hard. But again, yes, uh, it's uh, such like uh, when you see your relatives, when you see your dogs, uh, when you can just go for a walk in the wood, such um, very simple um, moments are very important nowadays. And it also helps me to keep myself uh, together because I know that I can just go for a walk. I can enjoy the rain. I don't know, whatever. I mean, also this war taught us and especially, not especially, but me for sure, to appreciate very small things, which in normal life I didn't pay attention to. And that's, I guess it's important and I want to keep it with me in the future as well. Of course, yeah. Well said. Well, Eva, thank you so much for your time, for your wonderful insights that you've shared with our listeners, for opening yourself up and relating what can only be described as a challenging and difficult situation. But your work is really, really powerful. And I hope more people, as a result of listening to this podcast, are going to search out your work and find out where they can see what you're doing, and especially the Holding Hope Project. That's a wonderful piece. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to talk and to be heard. And this is was wonderful conversation, and I appreciate this so much. Thank you. So we had a great talk with Eva and a wonderful way to start our new podcast adventure, of course, with such an emotional journey of a young photographer who saw her life as a photographer too change and by that also changing her way of documenting her own world. What do you think, Dave? I was blown away by what she said. I never really thought before about war documentary photographer and how they go through it and the emotional things. She was amazing. And I really think we did a great first episode. It's good. It's going to be hard to beat this, but we're going to try. Thanks everyone for listening. Don't forget to check out the show notes in the description where you can find out more about our guest 
and some links we've prepared for them waiting for you. If you're new to the show, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. We're in any of the major podcast listening apps, and maybe you can leave us a comment also. We'd really like to hear from you because it helps us a great deal to move this show forward. If you want to know more about us, check out our own links in the show notes as well and consider maybe buying us a coffee or two so we can get fresh photography content out to you each month. We leave you with a quote that seems custom made for today's discussion from the legendary documentary photographer Dorothea Lange. She said, Photography takes an instant out of time, altering life by holding it still. Thank you for listening today. Now put down your coffee, pick up your camera, get out there and document life. 